I'm on. Oh, that's wonderful. So this is really fun. I'm here with some people I really, really love. They're, they're really cool people, as you know. And I'm not going to introduce them and give you a big bio, because if you don't know who these people are already, I advise you to Google them, Twitter your friends, or use your lifeline and find out. But we do have Peter Molyneux, Will Wright, Bing Gordon, Lauren Lanning, and Ed Freeze. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about them. <clears throat> and I'm Russell DeMaria, and uh, I'm a writer and designer and consultant and do these different things in the industry as well. Um, and one of my passions has always been, for, for a really long time, is the idea that games are very powerful as tools of learning and inspiration, and that we may not be doing everything we can to utilize that to affect people positively, both on the individual level and as a, as a society. Um, in the old days of GDC, going back in the 80s, we used to always have a big banquet and people would dress in funny costumes and there would always be a speaker from outside of the game community. People like Orson Scott Card, uh, Harlan Ellison, John Perry Barlow, people like that. And the theme of their talk every single year was, you guys have a tremendous responsibility. You are doing something powerful. And we're talking about the 80s and the, maybe the early 90s before this all stopped. But they recognized even then that games are not just trivial entertainment. Games are very powerful. And that we as designers and developers of games need to be aware of what we are doing. With this panel, and I didn't intend immediately, originally to have five people on the panel, but unfortunately they all said yes. <laughs> and I couldn't say no. So with this panel, we, we're going to have to move quickly to get anything out of one hour. I'm going to allow 15 minutes at the end of this for questions, and there's a microphone up here. And so uh, be prepared if you want to ask questions, that, and then they're going to kick us out of the room. I, I can't go late because they won't let us. Um, one thing the GDC people asked me to do is ask you to move into the middle uh, if there's uh, seats empty so that it can fill in, and also to turn off your cell phones and do all that hubbub. So um, <clears throat> that, that's my obligation to GDC. I've done it. So now I'm going to start with a question. This is a yes or no question, because I figured then we will get through this quickly, um, of each panelist. And I want you to answer. It's either yes, no, or I, that depends. You have three options. No discussion. Do you think that game developers have an ethical responsibility towards the people who play their games? And we can start with Peter. I can't just answer that in one word. I can't answer that in one word, Russell. Just That's say impossible. Yes, no, that I'm going to say yeah. I'm going to obviously say yes. Okay. That depends. Will allow you to have a follow-up. Yes, ish. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, and everyone else. I'm going to say it. Okay. <laughs> now, I want to hear from you guys. And I want you to be really loud. I want to hear some animation here. Do you think, well, for, I'm going to ask you, if it's a yes, say yes now. One, two, three. Yes. Okay. If it's a no. No. <laughs> Thank you. We need to. I want to play your game. <laughs> All right. So we've gotten through the, the first hurdle here. Um, we all agree that there is something that we want to do. So I'm going to go back to Ed. Ed, why is it de that depends? And I agree with that. So my premise has always been um, that a game is, has to be entertaining, and it's an industry, it's a business, so it needs to make money. It needs to reach a lot of people. But then again, if you're trying to have a positive impact on people, 
it's going to be much more effective if you reach 5 million people than if you reach 5,000. So why not make a successful game? And so the first step in making any game is to make it successful, to make it appeal to an audience and sell well, make the money so you can make the next game or the sequel. But at the same time, you can do something that intentionally does that. So, so the question of whether games are positive is not a question I need to ask, because I think they have positive values already. That's established. But the question of can we create games with positive values or positive impact of some kind on their players with intention behind doing that is, I think, the main question. It's not that it's accidental. It's, it, you know, did, did Will, when he created SimCity, did he, did he intentionally say, I want to make a positive impact on people? Or did he say, I want to make a cool game about, you know, cities and, and working with, you know, building and people and, and structures? And, and I don't know the answer to that, so let's ask. Were you thinking of your impact on the people, or were you thinking about the game you wanted to create more? Well, I'd like to clarify kind of our responsibility to the player versus our responsibility as designers to the medium. Because I think I feel a stronger responsibility to the medium to kind of prove what it's capable of, you know, in terms of societal change. Yeah. You know, secondarily, I'm going to do that by influencing players, having players go and have a different perception when they walk away from the computer, they see the world in a slightly different way. They understand mm -hmm. the world in a different way. And that, to me, has proven that the medium is powerful and shows potential, and hopefully we'll attract more designers into that path. But I think my primary responsibility is, right now, I feel to the medium, not to the player. The mm -hmm. player is an indirect kind of symptom. Peter, last year I called you Don Quixote. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I'm still trying to find out who that guy is. Who's <laughs> your book? Because what Peter's been doing for forever is creating games where there's consequences, where there's good and evil, and you get to be a choice as a player and discover what's, you know, what your path and what, how the consequences of that path might affect you through the games that he develops. And um, so... What do you think that your, you know, impact on people is by doing that? Well, I mean, for me, it, 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 it's what Will said is absolutely right. If you walk away from a piece of entertainment, let's not get, make any mistakes. That's what we're making here is a piece of entertainment. And you kind of look at the world in a slightly different way, maybe look at yourself in a slightly different way, then that's great. And I think there's some enormous value in that. There's enormous value of thinking of designing a game around that. And actually, that's what kind of fable you know, parts of fable are. And what's so fascinating about it is that people have stories about playing fable. Now, I didn't really deeply think about this when I, you know, helped design it. It's just the consequence of giving people some freedom within a game. Actually, I was standing down here and a, a lady came up to me and she told me this wonderful story about her son who had had got a girlfriend in fable and who had, they got married and they'd gone back home and they went to bed and then to his surprise, he ended up with a baby in the morning. And this 14-year-old uh, boy said, Mommy, I'm never not going to use a condom ever again. <laughs> now, you know, that's great. I mean, I didn't think, hey, we, there's a positive message about condoms to be had in this game here. <laughs> and I think that's the point is, one is, this is a very challenging thing. Firstly, culturally, the world is a very different place. Culturally, you can teach one message in one territory, and that can be a very different message in, a, in another territory. That's the first thing. The second thing is we have got to remember we're entertaining people. If we try and preach, then we're far less likely to have that real positive people walking away and sort of seeing things about themselves and, and uh, the world around them. Well, that actually, that actually brings up uh, something that I've thought about and why I have you five people. Because there's more questions I want to ask you individually, but, but that actually segues into something that I want to ask about. So let's say, let's say that you know, you're trying to present this idea of positive impact, and you want to think about, well, how would that work? And, and because some things could be more ambiguous than others and, and have different mm -hmm. impact on people, um, and, and, and each of you has like a different, like perhaps style or, or approach to the way games are made. And so, you know, you may think in terms of your own games, but I want you to think beyond that. I want you to think in a broader sense. If you were creating the visualization of the new game in the future that has some way of reaching people, reaching out beyond the, the entertainment to help them, 
What are the elements that you would look for in that game, or how would you visualize and, and maybe describe that to somebody else who's saying, I want to make a game and I have the skills, but I want to go beyond that? What, what would you tell them? Let, let's start at the other end with, with Ed. Okay, well, I'm one of, the, one of the people up here who isn't a game designer, at least I don't consider myself one, so that's a, that's a tough challenge for me. Um, I, I, uh, I, I just think we're not very... I guess I'm not going to answer your question. I, I, I just, I, I, I just don't think we're very good at it yet. I just don't think we're very. I just don't think we we, we take very many risks yet. I, I think we, we make a like the best talk I went to this whole week was Genova Chen, the designer of of a um, of flower, and and he talked about how uh, fun is just like this really narrow part of the whole spectrum of things we could be making games about, mm -hmm. and why are why are we just making games about this one little narrow thing, and we could be addressing the whole. Segment and that that to me was was really interesting. So I, I I'd rather hear actually from the designers the more technical stuff about how they would do it. You know. Okay. Well, Lauren, you you did with Oddworld. You you always had a vision of saying something through the gameplay that that spoke to society and spoke to what our situation is. How would you answer that question? I I think I think for us. We always had a tendency to look at entertainment like it's food. You know, we're, we're kind of like processed food companies, you know, and we could be making Twinkies or we could be making something that has some nutritious value, right? And if the wrapper is, you know, attractive enough and, the, you know, we can easily slip just pure garbage into there. And, and, you know, our society is reflecting the pure garbage input. And... So when we look at that and we say, well, if you're going to make food, are you going to make food that's good for people or are you just going to make money for entertainment food that tastes good but is going to have long-term, you know, possible uh, uh, em empty calories? And uh, so when I look at it, I go, how do we engage in the first, po in the first place? You know, what, it, what is it that the, 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 the market is eating and why is what we would be presenting something that's appetizing to them? And then at the, the other hand, you know, the other side of that coin is, and, you know, how, do you, how well do you sleep with yourself at night? What do you, you know, was part of the successes we had with Oddworld along the way, I think, was um, also in the executive community of game publishers because they liked that we were doing something that uh, they, we were, we were told several times, you know, I just feel so great. This is a game that I'm going home and I'm showing my, my kids, you know, and I don't feel that most of the time that that's something that I can do. So I think that... There's a lot of possibilities in attracting um, uh, various types of support, whether it's financial or from crews or, you know, uh, your studio, that if, if the intent is good, but it's not just lofty and clueless, that uh, you can get more support as long as you're smart enough to focus on what it is that the masses are consuming. And then I always looked at it like, you know, it's a bait and switch. You know, we'll, we'll show you something that looks like a, a, a Snickers bar, but really it's a carob-covered granola bar. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I first met Vin Gordon, it was back in about 1985, and uh, he was looking for somebody to be, uh, do documentation at Electronic Arts. And um, we were talking about me doing that, but I, my, I had a, a son that was about to be born in two weeks, and I was living on Maui, and he said, we need somebody right now. And I had to pass the job and um, maybe changed my life forever by passing up that job. But being uh, years You'd later... You'd be spectacularly rich now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you wouldn't um, be running a GDC panel. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, but being years later, you know, I met him at an airport and he had his kids with him. And, you know, we t we've talked about games and, and the fact is that we get older... And we have children, and we look at the impact of games on the children that we have in our lives. And we, we start thinking, because when we first started with games, we didn't think about this stuff. It was just fun and, and exciting and new technology and all kinds of opportunity. And, and so as the, as the industry itself grows older, so do some of the pioneers and people who are the movers and shakers in this industry. And they start thinking about these things. And that's part of why I think this panel exists and why we... Um, we have this discussion now that we didn't have 10 or 20 years ago. So, Bing, you want to answer that question if you remember what it was? 
These are chapters, not questions. <laughs> so let's see. Ethics of our users, uh, more sex, less violence. Uh, Peter Molyneux as Don Quixote. Let me tell you, it's fun to be Rosinante. Um, and then that question, so um, uh, when Electronic Arts founded, our founding ad was, can a computer make you cry? We see farther. And uh, the most emotional moment, I have two daughters, 19 and 17, ever had in our family was uh, uh, we had three kids in two chairs playing The Sims pre-launch. And I watched, and they were taking about 20 minutes and taking turns, each in their own house with their own families. And after about an hour of watching, fascinated, I went into the other room to do adult stuff. And uh, suddenly I hear a blood-curdling scream for anyone with kids. You know, you know that blood-curdling scream. Um, you know, you shiver and then you start running. And I start running and she comes out, runs right into me coming out of the office. And she says, Daddy, Daddy, Zelda killed my mommy. <laughs> Out of a fit of jealousy, this other player had uh, bricked up the bathroom when, uh, <coughs> when my daughter's uh, character was visiting because of jealousy and trying to steal a man. And uh, yes, um, a computer can make you cry when, uh, um, <laughs> when, when Will has uh, created a game. <laughs> The, um, I, would, uh, I think we have a responsibility in uh, uh, we're creating a whole generation that grows up seeing the world through different lenses. Um, I'm a big fan of John Dewey and learning by doing. He had uh, um, an essay about teaching kids about the Civil War by making them uh, um, try to um, de-seed cotton by hand and then use a cotton gin. And... Uh, the message the kids figure out at the end of the day is when you have the cotton gin, you need more people picking cotton. And, uh, you know, Will and Peter have created a whole category of simulation games called God Games, and Ed has actually worked with God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, for, uh, for anybody that you know has grown up since Nintendo, you know that uh, we, have, we have shaped the way they think and see the world. They're better at math. They're more, more productivity-oriented. They learn to read on games. Mm -hmm. um, who, would, who would have thought that kids were gonna that kids were gonna learn about math by trying to get two um, two virtual sims to hook up? But I've seen it happen again and again and again. Will, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think what's kind of counterintuitive about this is that you know when we think about games that are gonna foster positive change, we tend to think you know okay, what kind of experiences, positive experiences, can we give people in the games? But when you think about the history of media and what's actually made social change happen, it's typically been cautionary tales of kind of negative conditions that we want to avoid. You know, all the way back to Frankenstein, you know, in its sequel Jurassic Park, 1984, Brave New World. Etc. You know, those have been the things that were really powerful in changing the course of history. Uh, you know, it's, I still read a lot of city planning stuff, and it's amazing how often the term Blade Runner comes up in city planning literature, <laughs> basically as a cautionary tale that no, we don't want our downtown to turn into Blade Runner. And so, Blade Runner has become this landmark to be avoided. You know, sometimes it's you know more abstract and open interpretation. I saw Moby Dick on TV the other night, the old black and white version. And realized, you know, that in some sense it was like a cautionary tale for the Holocaust. You know, it was this guy, you know, that was totally mad, but basically brought all these people along with him into madness very incrementally, and they didn't even realize it. Mm -hmm. And so I think these negative experiences, and then when we look at game players where they really enjoy games, I've found, you know, by and large, that people enjoy failure in games more than success. Mm -hmm. You know, what they want is really interesting failure, diverse failure. They want to know why. Uh, but the larger you can populate that failure space, the more interesting the game tends to be. So I think that uh, counterintuitively, we might actually want to focus on representing states that we want society to avoid. Let players experience that in a safe, you know, playful, exploratory fashion mm -hmm. as a way to foster positive change. Like Grand Theft Auto? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, in fact, I think if you can go in and play, I play Grand Theft Auto a lot. I love the game. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting when you kind of, you know, just get into the sociology of it. And in some sense, it seems like a sociology simulator. You're going to all these different groups and you're getting a sense of kind of what their ethos is. And, you know, these guys, it's okay to kill, you know, people in a certain condition. Yeah. But then you kind of realize it's like an ecosystem uh, in a sociological dimension. 
And then if you were actually to go to New York or someplace like that, you would understand that not everybody is going to share your same grid of perception that you put on the society there. Mm -hmm. And that they have their own rules. They're, you know, kind of operating underneath. You know, a lot of them are economic, social, whatever. But, uh, I mean, even something like that, showing the negative side, gives you that perspective, a lens. In some sense, we're selling like sunglasses. We're selling new perspectives on the world. Mm -hmm. This we're, we're is, well, before we're you selling, go, Peter, I want to ask a question about Grand Theft Auto. What would you think, any of you, if Grand Theft Auto had in it an, a, a positive option where you could actually get a job, start a business, and deal with the gangs and, and have to be on the other side of the, the story, but you could be successful doing that too? Do you think that that would add something to the game that is missing that would maybe open up uh, more choice? I know people choice? that just play ambulance driver in Grand Theft Auto and they go around you doing that. You are one. You know. Admit it. Cop to it. You just added about twenty million to the budget. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but there were games like, uh, well, certainly uh, Fable, where you can play both sides, or Knights of the Old yeah. Republic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, really, Peter really always had both sides of the story, but Grand Theft Auto kind of had mostly one side. I, I think this brings up a really interesting <clears throat> point. What is the negative? What's the worst thing that we could do? Let's talk about that, yeah. because, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, actually, I'm struggling with that. I'm thinking, well, I'm, okay, I'm going to do the most negative game possible. Human sacrifice yeah. well, kind of ranks up there but, a little but, bit. But, you know, I think Will's syndicate. point... Will, yeah, Will Syndicate actually probably is a negative. I think Will's point is a really, really good one. If you want there to be a lesson, it doesn't mean sugarcoating everything. That's certainly not it. It actually is exposing people in a completely safe environment oh. to some really quite horrific things. Mm -hmm. Now, I think if you're an outsider looking in and you say, oh, you reward death, you know, the score goes up every time you kill someone, you know, that's, that's a very crude imagery of what, of what it is. But, you know, the opportunity here, just go back to the original thing that was said, the opportunity is to find out about something about yourself and something about the world around you. And I think your Moby Dick reference was exactly on. If someone plays a game and walks away from it and thinking, God, this must never happen in the world, you know, must, must never happen in my community, that is a huge positive. Mm -hmm. Now, that could be from a negative. So I'd like to uh, really ask the panel, what, what would be the terrible thing? Here's, here's, one, here's one for you. A, um, the Victoria's Secret models um, in the afterlife, 72 of them, in a game in Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> That's, okay. I want to again. I have, a, I have a true story about this. So the, the other day I was uh, having lunch with a, a well-known game designer who's here in the room, and uh, <laughs> she get, she was pitching me her idea, and so I, for fun I pitched her my idea, which was to build a game based on the My Lai massacre in Vietnam, and right. and which so I, I think that fits your category. Yeah, but we've right? already sort of built that game and, about a uh, hundred times. Right? Uh, well, <laughs> this was you got to do the killing part actually. <laughs> well, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and uh, but. but uh, just to give her a hard time. Her response was, well, that would make a better movie than it would a game, which I admit I'm not a game designer, but I didn't like, to, I didn't want to hear that because to me, this medium is so much more powerful, right? And the whole point was to, to put it in an interactive context to make the player complicit in the action. Yeah, I have to say one of the most emotionally powerful moments I've ever had in a game was when I first got black and white and I was experimenting with it, and just for the hell of it, I beat the hell out of my creature just to see what happened. <laughs> and it was bruised, and it was crying, and I really felt guilty, you know. And that was, I realized that I never felt guilty watching a movie, watching television, reading a book, that this was an emotion that was unique to games, and somehow this game had made me feel guilty about my actions. And, and, and it's that's, funny. That's what I was going for. We, 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 how about, how about, how about, how about cuddling? In a Sims game, when your wife comes over, looks over your shoulder, and asks what you're doing. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> or your mother. <laughs> Dude, you should have taken the job at EA. <laughs> I got, you know, I got to say, I think that a lot of us are just so full of shit, you know, because what we, what we, what we do as, as designers is we say, well, we're going to take. I mean, I'm convinced that. For, you know, most action gaming is really, psycho, uh, you know, sociopathic, right? So it's, uh, what do we do? We love blowing shit away. So we just need to have a righteous enough excuse to kill everything, right? So that's sociopathic, right? But at the same time, you know, like interest would be uh, holistic medicine, for personally. And a really effective means would be uh, homeopathics, right? So what's a homeopathic? We give you a little bit of the disease. 
you know, so that your resistance gets higher. So I'm, I'm actually focusing on, like, socio-homeopathic gaming, right? <laughs> <laughs> where, where we're going... You should move to San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, you know, traditionally we're, we're going, like, our, ours is actually, you know, the granola bar. This is, like, we're going way off the deep end, you know? I Are mean, you going like, to trademark that, socio-homeopathic game? It, that's not a bad idea. You know, we'll look into that, yeah. <laughs> we have? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> good teams. Have good people around you. But, uh, you know, just to add, when we created uh, the first Abe games, you know, there was a lot of infighting in the studio about whether or not we could let them play the whole game and, and fail, you know, because of behavior that they were doing on the first level. So it was, it was all these sort of metrics about what do gamers want. And I'd be working with our game designers, and they'd be going, it's just, it's just ridiculous. If I played through the whole game, you know, and I get to the end and I find out I did the wrong shit and I lost, that's just a really bad game. And I'm going, no, man, I want them to feel bad. You know, I want them to feel really crummy, you know, and, and so what? It breaks a paradigm, but let's, let's break some paradigms. And so, uh, you know, in that game, the nature was really about saving the guys, but it was a lot of fun to just kill them. All different kinds of malicious ways, you know, and we're like, yeah, enable it, you know, and if you remember in the day, I mean, we were just coming out of the SNES era and Nintendo was still, you know, pretty much like you can't do bad things to characters and that was driving a lot of the sensibilities. And we were like, nah, man, these guys you're supposed to save. We want you to just mulch them up all kinds of different ways. But when people actually got to the end of the game and they found out that they doomed the character that they played through the game, we started getting all of these emails and stuff that were saying, wow, that's the first time I ever really felt bad about my whole action through it. And then I went back, back and played the whole thing. And then I played it four times to rescue every one of them. You know, and it wound up being... I mean, Russell, you wrote the manuals on those. You, know, the, you wrote yeah. the hint guys on those. <laughs> and uh, it was a profound sort of impact. So we would get mail from uh, handwritten letters from mothers that would say, you know, it's just amazing. I hate the games my kids play, but it's the perfect babysitter, and I know they're home, and I know they're safe. But they were playing your game, and every time my eight-year-old starts killing the Mudokins, the five-year-old unplugs the PlayStation from the wall. <laughs> and we, we, we felt pretty righteous about that. You know. I think, you know, violence, you know, in games is perfectly appropriate. We never show the consequences, though. You know, I think really most first-person shooters, you know, 10% of the development effort should be on the first-person shooter, 90% should be on the rest of your life in prison. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> and, you know well, at that point... <laughs> Not only that, but, you know, um, I've talked to people who are watchdog people, and, and you know, they say the, the problem with, part of the problem with the violence in the games is not the violence itself, but the fact that there's you, people, they, they get this all the time, that people, uh, kids, you know, young men will end up in the hospital after gang violence. They've been shot, and they go, and they're in terrible pain, and they say, I didn't know it would hurt. <laughs> because they, really, honestly, because they thought, they've seen it in games and they've seen it on in movies, and they, they, the people are like, you know, I just got shot, you know, or, or in the movie, in the games, it just like the rag doll just falls down and nothing happens, but they don't show pain, and so these people didn't realize that a gunshot would hurt like hell. But those, those are the people that that that's kind of like you know when they used to talk about acid. And, well, it makes people jump off buildings. And you're yeah. like, well, who's ever going to jump off the building? It's kind of a good filter system for us. I mean, if as is going to make you jump off the building, then go, man. You know, but, the, but, the, <laughs> but the point is, a game, a game where we shoot up. people could show <laughs> that there really is a consequence to being shot, either whether you get shot or somebody you shoot somebody else. If we show that it's not really just a simple th- matter of, of a, 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 you know, a, an, an unnamed character dying or being eradicated from a game because he's a bunch of pixels, but that if it's meant to be realistic, because realistic is a big thing that people are looking for in in games, in first-person shooters especially, then let's look at the realism beyond just the fact that the graphics look cool and you're able to, you know, see more blood splatter. Let's look at the fact that maybe the guy you just shot is writhing on the ground and screaming. Uh, are you suggesting, Russell, that we put some sort of electronic um, yes. buzzer in the controller that can zap you with 10,000 volts? But no, surely, actually, you know, to your point, surely the games do do that. I mean, you do, if you get shot, your score goes down, you know, your health goes down. And, and I'm not sure much, what much more we can do. I mean, we can show the terrible consequences of someone dying. And, you know, I think there have been games that have done that, you know, quite well of 
and I'm struggling to think of an example that, you know, that death is a, you know, a really bad thing. But I'm not sure that, that we could do much more than other, other than pick up a big banner saying, no, don't do this at home, kids, like they used to do on <laughs> Jackass. Well, I, 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 hey, Russell, I, let's, let's go to a different topic because there's plenty of, pr- <laughs> plenty of proof that violent media does not cause violent behavior after about a second. No, I don't believe it does. I'm just saying that the... Uh, U- USC, there's been good research. Tracy yeah. Fullen over here can tell you, you know, about My it. book, A Reset, I did a lot of research on it. I talked to all the experts, and I agree. I'm not saying that violence in media causes violence in the real world, but there are things we can do to make sure that we understand the consequences of violence, including going to prison if you kill people in, in a, that kind of situation. Anyway, let, let, we will move on. And here's, here's another question, and it, it's a little more cut and dry kind of stuff, but, you know, it may end up with some discussion, and I love it when you guys talk. It makes my job a lot easier. Um, what specific things do you think that we can do? I, I look at a model that says we can teach... Uh, specific information, we can, mo- we can model behaviors and, uh, and ideas, we can simulate through simulation, we can simulate uh, events, or, or we can um, inspire people. And there's a lot of ways we can inspire people through games. What specific things do you think we as designers could intentionally do in our games uh, that would that would be beneficial to people, and, and I'm talking about things like, well, increasing their ability to critically think, or increasing their communication skills, or uh, you know, specific things. Like, so, so what do you think? What, what what are the things that come to mind that you think we could do if we intentionally set our mind to do it? Um, well, I, th- I think it's a very some interesting things are happening at the moment. Firstly that everyone's connected together now. Well, most of the people are connected together. We've got, you know, we've got um, cooperative games, and that's really interesting, you know, people going out and felt braving up to to hooking up with uh, somebody else and going out into a group, you know, like in World of Warcraft. And that is a really good social bonding message, I think, behind there. And I think more and more you're going to find more titles that are going to be centered around that cooperative, positive experience rather than a lot of the uh, competitive experiences. So there's, there's some real messages with that. And, and I'm sure there's some inventions that have yet to be invented about about linking people all over the world from different cultures mm-hmm. together. You know, especially when we're able to show how different one person is to another person and pe- people seeing those differences. And these all sound like incredible positives. We just need, you know, kind of more games to center themselves so, so, around so that. So creating a, more of a connection. And this is something you said in the Luminaries talk, too, is it more connection of people of different cultures and different yeah. thought I mean, and you know, understanding. Yeah. It, there's, a, there's a real positive thing here that, you know, someone from, I don't know, maybe North Korea is, you know, is kind of, Meeting, uh, meeting up with someone from America. And, they, they, you know, there's an enormous positive that could come from that. Now, whether we as designers actually encourage that or not, I'm not sure, but there is a massive positive. Yeah, it feels like a real lost opportunity because when you have these people in different cultures connecting, then they both become orcs and they're both subscribing to this yeah. fantasy environment yeah, or whatever it is, unique. whereas right. yeah. bringing in their real-life experiences and making use of that mm. in the game design exactly. feels so rich. Yeah, exactly. You know? exactly. Yeah, exactly. I agree. I think, I think actually uh, gaming culture is a great hope. I think game design is the new MBA. It's the best. Uh, it's the best training for leadership. We're exiting a TV generation where we get politicians who can do slimy advertising and have to look good, and they end up creating the equivalent of an Ultima Online MMO with a lot of newbie killing, bad, uh, bad economy, and corruption in the system. And we're heading to uh, you know World of Warcraft, where uh, um, a World of Warcraft society where um, the most productive place you can be is in a party, uh, where everybody can level up. It's not a zero-sum game. Um, you just have to make sure all the gold farming doesn't get done in China. <laughs> <laughs> so really, the life of society as as a World of Warcraft no, metaphor. It, it, you know, um, uh, kids spend. 25 hours a week in jail that we call school, and uh, uh, people people. Um, I would I would submit that kids learn more useful stuff gaming than they do in school. It's a uh, games are a better place to learn algebra, a better place to learn um, uh, reading, 
Um, if you're in something like uh, The Sims, it's a better place to learn storytelling and writing. Um, if you're in a World of Warcraft running a guild, it's a better place to learn leadership. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need games, not textbooks. So what can yeah. we do better? Exactly. You, you just named a lot of things we're doing already. Well, so. one of the things we can do, people like Tracy can uh, run, uh, run programs that train designers. Uh, my sense is about a third of the students in uh, university now want to change the world through games. Uh, there's a Games for Chain con Change conference in New York on May 27th. I think there is the, the sense now we have we have more good game designers than the video game business needs for the first time. Um, and I think uh, uh, the gaming techniques that a lot of people here know how to do can actually uh, educate and uh, and retrain. So we don't need to bail out. We don't need bail out for the video game business. We need video games to bail out the culture. Yes. But but we need to, at the same time, know that we can do this within the the, the context of commercially successful games, right? Well, well I mean yeah, that's, that's part of it. That's where I think it gets dangerous. I mean I think you get you, you know setting out to do this social change game is kind of like setting out like in the old days setting out to make a game for girls. In my opinion, you know, it's like it's like putting this this goal ahead of other things that are more important. I, you know, I just like to see games get more sophisticated. I mean, we first we just had simple games like Tetris, then we learned about character and story and added those layers. And now I think the layers are you know emotion and meaning. And if we can learn how to build those layers, then I think we're in a position to tackle bigger social issues. You know, you know think, as opposed to trying to do it from a more of a mechanic point of view. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think one of the challenges we face is that you know games have this cultural cachet, partially because they're kind of a renegade art form, you know, and this is why kids are so into them because their parents hate them, really, you know, and you know, so it's kind of cool to be in a first-person shooter playing Call of Duty 4, World of Warcraft, whatever. But if it's like let's play the recycle game, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, so I think we have to kind of figure out, you know, how we do this in such a way to where we're not losing our renegade status as, you know, kind of the rock and roll of our age. Uh, but yet, you know, getting the players that play these things to, you know, really have deeper skill sets that they can apply to more politically correct, you know, directions or more socially positive ones. I agree. And, and you know, this is something we've talked about before is that, you know, it's the last thing I would want to do is stand up and say, let's make weenie games. You know, it's like games should be fun, and fun involves challenge, and challenge sometimes involves doing the dark side of things. And, the, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean we have to make pretty little pink games. Um, we can make those, and that's fine, but we can also make dark, dangerous rock and roll games or whatever we want to call it, and I think we can still instill within that. I, I was talking to Will about an idea that I had of, you know, you have this kind of bigger game, but you end up, you know, meet a couple people and they're having an argument, and you end up helping mediate their argument, which would teach you a little bit about communication. You, you're successful. You, they take you home. Maybe they're really nice people. They give you the little the ring of magic, uh, you know, something or other that opens up doors for you. Or maybe they turn out to be vampires and they attack you and you have to fight them off. So, you know, I mean, that's fun for me. You know, I would think it would be cool if, like, you know, I got the, I thought these people were cool and they, they brought me back and they were going to give me something good and it turns out they're trying to eat and drink my blood and I get to fight them. That's fun. So I, I think that, you know, teaching or modeling or whatever we do in games doesn't have to mean they get sanctimonious or preachy or anything. I hope that would never happen, but that they're embedded within gameplay is something uh that allows that while you're having fun, while you're doing the things that, that intrigue you in games, and that can involve a lot of these things that socially seem, you know, counter, you know, like fighting you're, and stuff. Well, um, I don't know. You, you're almost done, right? <laughs> the, uh, um, I read your book. The, um, uh, so I want to shout out to social games. So there's a whole different element. So I would submit that uh, social networks like Facebook um, and online games in general improve social capital. Um, we are uh, we're, we have a young generation now that has more good uh, social relationships in the world than ever before. And I think uh, uh, one of the things that, that social game developers are starting to realize is one measure of games is how they help 
help players not only have fun but build social capital together mm-hmm. so make make better friends through gaming and uh, you know, I'm not going to use the word should we ought to use incentives not I think, I think should should be banned from the English language and I don't know how, actually I'll uh, <laughs> I'll pat anybody on the back who doesn't use should and I'll scowl when they use it you and I saw that thing the co-ed I was curious what you thought of that. It's basically a, these guys turn the whole world into an MMO, the real world, and but it's sort of a positive change, pay it forward kind of thing. So that, he's not sure. Well, I know, when, when you gauge people that they, right? that they want to succeed, uh, they tend to try harder. Yeah. And when they want to show off, they tend to try harder. Yeah. So well, getting people, you know, increasing motivation is a good thing. If you're a parent, you know that... All you really want for your kids is uh, health, self-esteem, and productivity. I think we're also we're like in the middle of this broad trend in the entire world, from you know top-down organizational structures to bottom-up. You know, one of the kind of clearest examples in games is the idea of user-generated content, and the players taking more role and responsibility in crafting and kind of steering what these experiences become. So I think a lot of it is us giving the players the tools to build socially positive games and just get out of their way. The, uh, you know, typically there's this translation process, you know, that happens in media, and luckily we're getting away from this top-down model. One of my favorite stories was it was a Hollywood producer pitching this new television show, and he was, you know, pitching this, you know, really positive show that was going to show how all the nations of the world had to learn to live together on this, you know, spaceship planet, you know, Earth, and uh, the show he was pitching was Gilligan's Island. It was showing shorts, you know. <laughs> and somewhere that concept kind of got lost in translation on the way down. And that's, you know, fairly typical of things, you know, from top down to bottom up. But I think the bottom up world is really where it's at now. So we really, I think we need to give some of this responsibility uh, and the tools to the players to do this. Well, I bet the, um, the creation of the editing tools in sport took more man years than it did to create the Constitution of the U.S. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. okay, and over to... time, we may find that they're as valuable. <laughs> we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, Lauren, you want to say yeah, something? I, I just want to say, you know, I, I, frankly, I think the, the, the uh, notion that uh, in, our, in, our, in our country that it has to be profitable is really ass backwards. I mean, we have a medium that the kids are absolutely, <laughs> that they're absolutely gravitating to these supercomputers that are giving them experiences, and they're very engaged by them, and they're socially connected with them. But, you know, if you talk to senators or congressmen, which occasionally we do, and they'll go, why aren't you guys be- building better stuff? And we go, why aren't you paying for it? You know, come on, man. You're giving billions of dollars of tax breaks. Here, here. Do you know we could redefine the educational system? It could be console-based. It would change everything. But you guys don't invest in any of it. The U.S. government doesn't invest in any of it. There's no tax breaks incentives for it. There's nothing. So, you know, every church is tax is 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 tax free, really. But if we if it comes to helping use technology to educate our kids and make them smarter, there's no support for it. Okay, I'm going to. I'm going to do one last thing, and then we're going to open it up to one questions. Minute. Getting ready, um, and I want. I, I'm going to make this really. I want you to do this briefly, and I know it may be difficult, but try to be really quick with it. Um, pretend you're you're pitching the ideal game that you envision you want to see right now uh, come out, or, or that that's the next game you want to see happen. Not necessarily your game, but you're pitching this to these guys. What do you want to see them create? Okay, let's start with that. Just to sc- or you want to start at this end? Yeah, you start didn't. at that end. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look quite ready. Well, that was going to give me time to think. We can start in the middle. <laughs> Bing is always ready. <laughs> I'll start. Okay, okay. Lauren, Lauren looks sure. ready. Lauren's ready. Okay. okay. I, I would just say that, that traditionally we've had a mindset where we, we build something really big and then we try and you know, bring it to market. And we, and we try to predict a lot of things along that way. And if there was some, you know, and I've seen lots of presentations where pre- people are presenting things that are really big. And I think really big is one of my really big lessons, is, is trying not to be big. And in fact, as we head towards the future, if we're going to see something that's smart, aside from its social, you know, imp- implications or possibilities, is that start really small. Start really small and use that o- audience instead of your collective, you know, 20 people and the 30 people the publisher might give you for focus testing and all that. Start really small, get it out there and let the people help shape it. It's, you know, I mean, 
the will and, and these guys understand that very well, even though starting small hasn't really happened yet on that side of the fence. But, but, it, but learning from the audience has, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so that was sort of more advice. But if, does any of you have, like, a way to describe the game you want to see, Peter? Yeah, I mean, I would like, I'd love to say, I think, to start off with a very short sentence. Firstly, I think we're doing pretty good. You know, we've got brain training, we've got The Sims, we've got all sorts of games which teach positive messages. We're not doing bad, but there's some things that we're not doing, and, you know, hey, guess what, I don't think entertainment's doing. You know, is there some way that we can mix old with young? You know, there aren't many forms of entertainment that old and young can mix together. Maybe I'm saying this because I'm getting old now, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, is there a way that we can, you know, we can take someone from one culture and, and, sh- and glorify their uniqueness in an environment that makes them, you know, feel as special as someone from this environment? So there is untapped territory here, and that untapped territory leads to sort of really creative, uh, uh, really creative uh, entertainment. Okay. I, you know, I have a great example, I think, of what you're asking. Is There was a uh, serious games competition at Cal, and uh, we helped judge it. The, and the winner was actually a brilliant, uh, I think, an, an astoundingly brilliant and profound solution. And people had all kinds of really complicated things that they were proposing, and they were basically, you know, never will be concepts. And, but the one that won was a mobile concept, and uh, most of the team was from India, and they recognized that in India... Uh, people had to get to the cities to work, especially young people. They had to do this. But there were so many different dialects spoken, so many different languages, that just being able to know how to buy a train ticket was a prohibiting factor in their ability to get to a city. So a game, they were conceptually laying out a very light, very intelligent game that was really a game about how to get to the city and go to work. And it was integrated so that it would, you know, speak all these native tongues, and yet convert for them how to get the right change, how to deal with the currency, how to get it, buy the ticket for the train, how to read the train stop. You know, it, it honed in on exactly the type of information that they need to grow and, and, and you know, get established a more healthy middle class. I, th- I thought that was brilliant. Okay, Bing, and then we're going to have to go to the questions. That's fine. So uh, I got into games because I want to live life random access rather than serially. So I'd like to see um, a, basically a Groundhog Day game where my daughters could pre-play multiple lives. And that's me as a parent. Me as a player, I'd like to see World of Warcraft in Flash that uh, my daughters would play with me through Facebook. For free? And, or Second Life done well. Okay. <laughs> Well, one last thing. So I can imagine a game, maybe you call it how the world really works, you know, where there's some kind of a graphic representation of the way the world works, and you actually get people from different cultures coming in and trying to collaborate on agreeing how the world works, you know. And, you know, you can see differences in gender, age, culture, but I think just having people come together and have a shared model or even understand why our models are different uh, would be a huge step in the right direction. Great. Okay. Let's open it to questions now, and um, there you are. So go ahead. Hey, um, so hopefully this doesn't overlap too much, but uh, there was this concept of adding moral nutrition to things, uh, you know, flipping the guy uh, looking for a Snickers bar into getting a granola, a carob-covered granola bar. And perhaps as a takeaway uh, for people who are working on games right now, uh, I could ask the panel to do a quick uh, mental experiment, which is what is the one feature that uh, each of you might uh, add to a game like, uh, say, the PlayStation Home that would add moral nutrition to it from where it is right now? <laughs> well, let's, let's start with PlayStation Home. Yeah. <laughs> for, for inspiration. <laughs> yes. I, I think it's kind of a good example of, uh, you know, a, a, of a product trying to find a market, right? So its intent is driven by emulation rather than innovation. This is just, just my opinion, of course. And, and so we'd say, well, what, what is really driving the choices that are constituting that experience, that virtual place. And those, what's 
primarily driving that, of course, you know, is economics and sort of, you know, a save us type of solution, where as soon as you open up that everyone can say what they want, that everyone communicate on an online circumstance, I don't know, I think it becomes compoundingly more difficult. So suppose you just took that system and added a simple karma simulator. So zero-sum game, you have karma points, you know, people can give you karma points, you can then give them back out, and to see what develops from there. Yeah, it's a sweet world. I've got an interesting one. What I would do is allow people to punish and reward, as in slap, as in the creature in Fable, or stroke other people in home. Because that then, I think that would be really interesting. I could walk over to you and say, hey, I didn't like you, and then see what happens with that, with that culture. See how many people you know, are nice people and how many people are nasty. You've got to give people the tools to be nasty to enable you to comment on how nice they are. See, yeah, I, I, would, bad or, I guess yeah. I, I, wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do it in PlayStation Home. I would do it in the real world, you know, and like <laughs> I, iPhone based. So you can, I just, I love the idea of taking these game mechanics that we've learned over so many years and applying them back out to the real world. So everyone's got iPhone, you know, so take Will's Karma idea, take, you know, take whatever, take nutrition. Let's apply the game mechanics to the real world. Uh, through the through the things that we're carrying now that we that we can use to communicate together, I, I think that's a huge exciting area. Thank you. Um, hello, this question is for any of you to answer, and it's uh, related to military shooters and directly related to your suggestion of a melee type game. Um, <laughs> in my favorite m- mission in the original Ghost Recon was one where we had four objectives, three of which were traditional military, and one which was optional, uh, where to avoid civilian casualties. And uh, there were a couple civilian NPCs running around and you could either kill them or not kill them. Um, And we haven't seen a lot of that in military shooters since then. Um, And uh, I was wondering if you could, um, I mean, there are civilians in war zones, right? Um, Why don't we see that in, in military shooters? What do you think? I can give you an answer that, that I heard once from a publisher that was, they, they, they said about a game that we were proposing, they just go, man, it's just so dark, you know? And I was like, you're building games on, in war in Baghdad right now, and this is dark? You know, and he goes, yeah, but we're not having the, you know, the blown up babies and the medics, and, and I go, right, right, you're not. You're, you're just distilling war to its fun parts. You know, but the thing that the, the the guys come back with shell shock with and, and fucks them up for the rest of their life, that's void and extracted out of the game, you know, which I feel is pretty perverted. Yeah, no, by the way, that was the other comment I got from this designer was it make a better film than a, than a game and uh, no publisher would touch it. And, you know, and there's another example of people who, uh, who know about Kim Swift not being able to talk uh, at the game design challenge earlier this week because the topic was sex. So she couldn't talk about a game about sex uh, among game developers. You know, and I, I just think that's ridiculous. And I think we have to get beyond that stuff and, and you know, we're going to have to move the business forward. So we need, we're, we're short on time, and there's a lot of people there, and I hate to see when people are still standing there and we have to leave, so let's try and keep it fairly quick. It's a really a Russell D. Maria book signing. <laughs> Um, I'm a uh, graduate student at a non-video game exclusive program, and uh, that's actually been a conscious choice for me to uh, hopefully be able to bring in something else to video game design. Um, That's the plan anyways. Uh, And uh, with things like Video Games Live, which is a music concert and and 8-bit art shows uh, all affecting culture, uh, my question to you all would be um, to what extent, if if any, should game designers uh, reach out to other mediums um, in affecting culture. My personal opinion is, if you don't, your your work gets stagnant. I think games are one of the few art forms that you know include all these others. We include music, video, you know, things done a product design, user, you know, usability. So I think game designers certainly need to kind of be fluent in all these other things. In the same time, I would, you know, the convergence of taking intellectual properties across media is becoming stronger every year. So I think game designers need to think more in terms of being media designers and not just game designers. My experience is the best game designers have the best bookshelves. 
Have they got anything on those bookshelves? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, um, I'd like to come back to the violence in games question because I have the feeling that we kind of danced around it by saying that um, studies show that media uh, have no impact on violence in people. But it seems to me you can't... There's a logic fallacy uh, in saying that at the same time, game can affect people, and, but they can only affect them for good. If they can affect people and they are different from the rest of the media, then they can also affect them for bad. And what do we do about this? And well, but, but hold on. I mean, that's a notion. If you look at, there's, you know, there's about nine supreme, you know, various court decisions that every time someone comes and says, no, but it's affecting this brain pattern, it's affecting that brain pattern. I mean, I, I debated Jack Thompson on this because uh, it, while I totally believe in socially responsible games, I also believe that frauds are being perpetrated on the American people, and the media is, is catering to that. So the reason why these arguments continually lose in court to the same answer from the judges, which is these claims have absolutely no basis in fact. And so when we, when we extract, I mean, if, we, if we're going to say games, but look, if game, violent games are bad, I'm like, oh, back up. Let's look at TV first. Right? No, Let's no, look at the I, newspaper I, I, first. I agree with that, but, but yeah. all I'm saying is you can't come here and say to us games have an impact on people and we can use games to have an impact on people and at the same time say, oh, but there's no problem with violent games. Right? Actually, um, I'd like to answer that. I've done a tremendous amount of study on it and I've talked to all the experts on both sides of this, including the people who did the major studies on violence. And um, I'll, I'll tell you that your point is that games can influence people and it could be for positive or negative and I agree with that. Right. In terms of the violence issue, it's not just games, it's all media and the fallacy that they can cause people to become violent has pretty much been proven not to be true. But I'm talking specifically so, about games. Specifically. Right. But, but I'm saying that all media have been given the same thing. I don't want to prolong this discussion. We I need want Simon. Other people to, but I agree, I understand that, and, and if you want to read my book, Reset, the whole first chapter is about that. It'll help. <laughs> All right. My question is specifically for Will Wright. At the beginning of the talk, you made a distinction between a responsibility to the medium and a responsibility to the players. And the way I look at it, uh, the sort of actions that will improve the medium, like getting greater sophistication of emotion and trying to convey more powerful themes and stuff, will fulfill both of those uh, responsibilities. So I just wanted to see if you could explain that distinction you made more. Well, I, I think that they are very convergent, the two ideas here. I think that right now, you know, we have this kind of infant medium, you know, that we are very, you know, early in the stages of nurturing. And as designers, I think that there are certain things that we can do that are laying fundamental foundations so that five and ten years down the road, we'll be having much more positive effects on the players. So things like this roundtable, you know, really are focused on the medium. How do we bring the medium into a space where we can, you know, encourage more people to have positive effects on the players without destroying the DNA of what really makes our medium cool? So I think it's really more of a strategy thought process, but the end goal really is the same. You know, if anything, I just want to accelerate to the point in time where we're having a more meaningful impact on the player. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we were talking about using um, negative reinforcement in order to have a positive effect on players, and this is absolutely true, I totally agree. But the question of social responsibility in video games is usually raised by people who are watching players and seeing these negative reinforcements, uh, not so much the people who are actually playing the games, most of the time anyway. So my question is, is there anything that we can do as designers for these people who don't play games to erase this stigma, or is that something that's pretty much left up to the community? Um, surely it is making the games more accessible, because I think most of the people have negative, negative thoughts and comments about games. There's a high correlation of those people not being able or not having any access to those games. And, you know, I think that accessibility and the fact that, you know, people of all ages and backgrounds and politicians play games, then they're far less likely to have been negative about those games. So I think, I think that, you know, we're trying to make games broader and broader for more and more audiences, and then I think we'll end up being a net, net positive. And if they're readers, 
people like James Chi and um, uh, Mark Prensky and me and other people, we've written books that were aimed at helping people understand what the positive potential and, and impact of games can be. And so there really is a good deal of literature out there um, for those people. Reset was written for non-gamers specifically. So I like to advise uh, parents to sit down with their kid at the computer or at the TV and have the child talk about challenges and what they're learning and how they think about it. And I've told one mother that her 14-year-old son running a guild in an MMO is way more valuable than reading Dostoevsky in the original Russian, and she didn't believe me until she sat down with her son. Yeah, I mean, I, I have two young kids, and uh, my wife's not a gamer, and, you know, she's like, they, all they want to do is play Pokemon. I'm like, that is so great, you know, and here's why, you know, that, you know. Now we can say, all right, you got to do your homework before you can play Pokemon. You got to do this before you can do that. You know, or let's turn it into a, liter a literacy thing, right? Let's, you know, the four-year-old's learning to read through Pokemon, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. so it's just we have to educate people that the, the opportunity side of this, right? I think I'm going to get the high sign in a moment, um, but I would say in answer to your question, have them call Bing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, thanks, so, guys. I think uh, I'm about to get that, and I wanted to tell you about two things that are happening. Um, there's a roundtable at 12 in room 113 that's going to be sort of a follow-up to this. Uh, I don't know if any of these people can come, but they're all invited. But you're all invited, or at least as many as you can cram into the room, to further to continue this discussion. So if there's anything you haven't been able to do, um, we can talk about it more then. And later at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the positive impact SIG of the IGDA is also having a round table to talk about these kinds of issues. Uh, 113? I think it's in room 113. 114. Okay. Thank you.